We start with our top story. A Reuters report says Sudan's paramilitary rapid support forces expressed willingness to engage in immediate, unconditional ceasefire negotiations with the Sudanese army. The statement was signed in Addis Ababa with Takadum, a civilian coalition. RSF chief Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo noted that the same declaration has been extended as an invitation to the army. He emphasized the potential of this document to form the groundwork for peace negotiations aiming to resolve the nine-month-old conflict. The civilian coalition, led by former Sudanese Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok, has been actively exploring solutions to the conflict. The coalition has invited Army Chief Abdel Fattah al-Burhan for a similar meeting. Meanwhile, Dagalo, also known as Hamdeti, is currently on a regional tour, marking his first public appearance outside the country since the conflict erupted in April. The tour precedes the highly anticipated face-to-face meeting with Borhan. To gain insight on these unfolding developments, Nabil Biajo speaks with Kalhud Kaher, the director of Confluence Advisory, a cartoon-based think tank. I thought it was a, a very big gamble by the civilians. Initially, their invitation had gone out to both Borhan and Hemeti but only Hemeti responded. Now, that could be for two reasons. One, it could be that Burhan and the people behind him, like they had done before, uh, refused to uh, agree to a meeting. They have been very reluctant to agree to a meeting. They pushed back against the EGAD planned meeting before Christmas. So this is not outside of, of their sort of approach to mediation so far. The second reason could be that the invitation to Burhan and the way that it was phrased could have potentially pushed him to not agree to attend. We know, for example, that uh, Hemeti and the RSF have been insisting that Burhan make himself present as the head of the Sudan Sudanese armed forces, not as the head of the Transitional Sovereignty Council. And so if the initial invitation went out to address to Burhan as the head of the Sudanese armed forces and not the head of the Transitional Sovereignty Council as well, that may have stopped him from agreeing to come. But without seeing those letters, we don't know quite the reason Bur- um, Burhan refused to attend. I think the surprising thing for a lot of people is that the meeting still went ahead with the other two parties, namely Hamdok and Hemeti. And with so many rumours running around of uh, an alliance between some civilian actors and the RSF, I think the optics of this could have been better managed um, because a lot of people um, still have those misgivings. Taqaddum, this civilian coalition led by Hamdok, is being presented as the most extensive civilian bloc since the Forces uh, for Freedom and Change, uh, which, of course, played a crucial role in in the protests leading to the removal of President Omar Bashir. Do you see hope in this coalition? What outcomes can potentially you know, be achieved by engaging with the warring parties? I think it's important to have a civilian, uh, broad civilian front. The question is whether Taqaddum is that broad civilian front right now. And there have certainly been a lot of criticisms of Taqaddum um, for many civil society actors that it's just not inclusive enough. I mean, certainly, if you look at the delegation of people who went to um, meet with Hemeti, there were very, very few women. And it was a, pretty much the same old names indicating that you know newer voices, younger voices, uh, potentially are not being heard even inside of Taqaddum. And so it's these kinds of concerns that I think will allay people's um, readiness to join Taqaddum. That said, there has to be a civilian front that engages with the belligerents. The question is, what is the manner of that engagement? They need to be seen as following the interests of the people and not their own political interests, which historically has not been the case for many Sudanese elites. That is a challenge for them right now, to communicate what they're doing, to act transparently, and to ensure that they communicate that they are serving the broader interests of the Sudanese public and not their own narrow political interests. Yes, and especially after the total failure of the Jeddah uh, negotiations uh, led by the Americans and the Saudis to stop the war or achieve anything tangible, really. And now there's more pressure on Sudanese actors, regional actors, to present something better and to be more transparent, like you just mentioned. 
international mediations work on a very different logic to more local mediations. International mediations, whether they are Jeddah, IGAD, AU, or the Cairo Initiative, are much more to do with the countries and the institutions that lead the mediation rather than Sudan and what's going on internally. For example, we haven't seen any of these mediations really pick up on the humanitarian issues or the protection of civilians issues. We haven't seen, for example, the Jeddah talks talk about um, violence in Darfur as it was happening while the negotiations were ongoing, um, focusing rather um, on a national picture, which in many ways obfuscates what people are going through um, on a more domestic level. And so, you know, these more internationalized mediations have had a very difficult time in figuring out how to respond to um, events in Sudan because their lens is not focused on Sudan, but rather on the internal politics and geostrategic interests of the countries that lead the mediations. So that's why there is a gap, really, for more domestic uh, initiatives to take the lead. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, opposition candidates continue to reject the results of the country's presidential election. The National Election Commission on Sunday declared incumbent president Felix Teshikedi the winner of last month's vote. The election commission said Teshikedi won 73% of the vote. The runner-up, businessman and former provincial government Moisi Katumbi, had about 18% of the vote. There were 18 other opposition candidates, most of whom won only about 1% or less of the vote. Nine opposition candidates, including Katumbi, signed a declaration Sunday rejecting the election and calling for a rerun. Despite the complaints, the country, nearly the size of Western Europe, has been called. Reporter Zadem Natizaidi spoke with people in Goma, the largest city in the country's eastern region, to hear what they think should be the top priority for, for President Tashikedi's second term. Hubert Masomeko is most concerned about the ending the violence in the eastern region where more than 100 armed rebel groups operate. He says, first, it is urgent that the president and his entire government invest in peace in the eastern DRC. He said the government's first priority should be to establish peace and state authority throughout the national territory. Masemeko also says the president needs to address the economic situation and inflation and to work much harder on macroeconomic stability. Georges Bihamba says he wants to see peace and security first. Uh, my expectations which are very urgent, first of all, is the security. Security in the east part of the DRC. You know, it has been a long time our land is attacked by enemies, M23. So now the first urgent mission that the president should do is to, first of all, to eradicate, to put an end to this war that has mourned a lot of families. Joshua Intakala suggests different priorities for the new government, education and infrastructure for the vast country. He says the president should focus on the continuation of free primary education, which has to be effective, especially in terms of school infrastructure, including buildings. And Intikala says the second expectation is that we have roads that are completely impassable and that better roads facilitate interprovincial communication. Jane Bashonga also wants a focus on the economy, especially employment. I think what the, the new government should use as the resolution for 2024 or of the second mandate is to fight against unemployment of youth. In DRC, you can see that the majority of young people, they are not employed. And this joblessness in a country determines and it triggers a lot of problems. You can see young people, they don't have any occupation. They're spending all the day home, just drinking, smoking and going into bad things. 
The opposition alleges that chaos at many polling stations, which caused the election commission to extend voting another day, favored Tshisekedi and damaged the integrity of the vote. The DRC Constitutional Court is expected to confirm the provisional results on January the 10th. The French Foreign Affairs Ministry announced Tuesday that its embassy in Yemi will remain closed until further notice. Pali cited in a statement what it called grave impediments on the embassy's missions which go against the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. The ministry listed a brocade around the embassy movement restrictions imposed on staff and an entry ban on diplomatic personnel traveling to Niger. Consular activities which were managed by the embassy will now be handed over to consulates in West Africa. Speculations had been rife, particularly after French troops exited Niger in mid-December. According to a statement issued by the French Foreign Affairs Ministry, the activities of the Niger embassy will now be conducted from Paris. The diplomatic representatives will maintain ties with French citizens in Niger and financially support NGOs working in the humanitarian sector to serve local populations. Palace relations with Niamey soared after a military coup in July. At the end of August, the Nigerian military regime ordered the expulsion of French ambassador Sylvain Etienne.